You are listening to the Renewal Podcast, a weekly podcast that features interviews and discussions and and teaching on various biblical and theological subjects. My name is Colt Robinson, and I'm the lead pastor at Bethel Church in rural South Dakota. And we do this because we believe that our minds are to be shaped and and renewed by the life-giving and transforming Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we pray for the next few minutes that as you listen, that you'll just see Jesus more clearly. So welcome to, to Renewalcast. We're going to talk about the Lenin Baptist Confession, and we're in chapter 10. And we're going to try to cover the, the entire chapter today on effectual call. So the first thing that we need to do is... Um, well, let's read. Let's read the the confession. Jay, you wanna you wanna continue as our our reader. Those whom God hath predestined to life, He is pleased and is appointed in an accepted time, effectually to call by His Word and Spirit out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God taking away their heart of stone and giving to them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills and by his almighty power, determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ. Yet so as they come most freely being made willing by his grace. So the first thing now that we've, we've read the confession that we need to do is, is kind of define what we mean by effectual call here. Right? When we were talking about the, the order salutis, we, differentiated between uh, calls, right? We talked about a, a general call and an effectual call. And maybe that would be helpful at, at this point. Well, the general call is the call, uh, the, the command of the Great Commission is go and make disciples of all the nations. You know, we preach the gospel to all people. Um, God commanded everyone to repent. And so there's a call of salvation that goes up to everybody in the whole world. The church is to take that message and preach it. And so that, that's the, what we call the outward gospel call that, that word, that preaching word comes to people in a word form and an outward call. And that goes out to everybody. Then the, what we would say the effectual call or the internal call is the call that accompanies that outward call. So if we're happen to be preaching the gospel to a, an elect person, that outward call will then in God's timing, become an inward call by the Holy spirit, taking that word and bringing it to the heart and um, basically making the word, the summons of the word effective so that the sinner hears the voice of God in the gospel call and responds to it. Now, uh, I think maybe it'd be helpful to just, I see a distinction between regeneration and effectual call, but I don't, I don't know that the confession does. What do you guys think of that? What's the, what's the distinction? Well, like Burkhoff, Burkhoff sees a distinction. They both go basically together, kind of like uh, peanut butter and jelly or whatever. That isn't a good illustration, but, but they both go together all the time. Regeneration, he would define as consists in the implanting of the principle of the new spiritual life in man. In a radical change of the governing disposition of the soul, he would he would. That's how he would define regeneration. And then he would define the effectual call more like we just did. So he would, he would say that, that, uh, that regeneration operates unconsciously in the person to make them alive. Then the effectual call operates consciously in the person. So they hear the gospel message. They both go together, but the confession, I don't think distinguishes the two. I think it just makes kind of a broad brush, uh, kind of puts regeneration under effectual call, but 
I'm not sure. Uh, chapter 13 on sanctification, paragraph one, they who are united to Christ, effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection are also further sanctified. Um, and it goes on. So it does actually mention regeneration there alongside of effectual call. There you go, Jay. Nice job. But I don't know anything. It, does, it does distinguish it then. Yeah. But here it doesn't here in this chapter, it doesn't distinguish it, but yeah, later it right. does. So right. yeah, good call. Chapter 15 as well. It doesn't mention regeneration, but God in their effectual calling gives them repentance to life. So they, they choose to use effectual calling again there instead of regeneration, or maybe they're linking them again. Uh, regeneration throughout history as and Burkhoff mentions this too is, has taken some different meanings um, it wasn't or some different defining it used to be more broadly um, after the reformation is when it got defined more narrowly before it was just conversion or uh, sanctification is how it was used and post reformation sometime it got defined more narrowly like we have it in order salute is prior to faith and repentance Exactly when that happened, I don't know, because even the, uh, um, which confession am I thinking of? Not the Westminster, but the... Uh, Belgic. 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 There you go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, so yeah, and I think there is a sense in the scripture where regeneration is seen in a broader sense. I do. So, like Calvin, I mean, he, 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 he definitely had a broader view of regeneration. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, I don't think you can get maybe dogmatic on how you're going to define it. But yeah, I think it is helpful to kind of tear it apart and, and understand that that regeneration is absolutely monergistic. It operates in the unconsciousness of man. It's a it's a it's a creative act. Regeneration is a creative act. Where effectual call is not a creative act. It's simply uh, bringing the message home to the heart, so the to the sinners newly given ear, awakened ear. Right. Yeah. They have to have that life to hear it. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I I mean, this, this illustration breaks down pretty quickly, but give the illustration sometimes a, a Billy Graham crusade. You know, Billy Graham is, is down and he's, he's preaching the, the gospel to everyone that can hear you know, so, so generally everybody is, is hearing that call to the gospel, but only some respond, you know, not, I mean, a lot of people at a Billy Graham crusade go respond and, and certainly not all of them are, are probably saved, but kind of, kind of an illustration that God, God does something in, in calling those and, and making that, that, that message come alive in them so that they see the, the truth and the, in the beauty of the gospel. And only God can do that. Yeah. Jesus said many are called few are chosen. So that's just mirrors exactly what Jesus said at a Billy Graham concert or con- whatever uh, uh, crusade. Many are called few are chosen. So what's the, what's the relationship here between the word and the spirit, right? He is pleased in his, in appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of the state of sin and death by which they are by nature to grace and salvation. Ordinarily, the way God has revealed that he works is by his word and spirit. And the gospel message, the word attended by the power of the spirit comes into the life. And it's that combination that, that God uses to save us. You know, I think we get into error when we separate them. I think the reformers generally kept them together, word and spirit together. He gave us life by the word of truth. The Bible says through the word of truth, we were born again. Um, James one eighteen. He brought us forth by the word of truth. 
but we we don't believe that the spirit isn't involved in that. We believe the course, the spirit has to give life and attend that word. Right. You said we get into error when we separate the two. What, what errors might we get into if we separate? Boy, we could get off in the weeds I, here. Yeah. I know. Fast, but um, no, no. I, and I, I, I'm the one that said it. So I was kind of kicking myself, but keeping it, trying to keep it in this context in the Bible, where the word of God is, the presence of God is, you know, I'm thinking of even Saul towards the end of his, uh, his life, he was looking for a prophet and he couldn't find God's voice anywhere. Uh, God wouldn't speak to him. And, and later he says, the presence of God has left me. And he equated the presence of God with the voice of God. And, and so I just, I just think generally we need to keep them together. Yeah, I, I agree. I was, I was listening to a, a podcast about new age and they had a, a lady on there that had written several new age books. And then uh, now it's come to come to faith, but she was saying things like, I thought I was a, a Christian. You know, we would take even verses here and there and, you know, we were into the the spirit. We believe in the Holy spirit and we would do all of these things, but she came to, to recognize that she was so infatuated by spiritual things and experiences and, and all of this things over here that her definition of Christianity wasn't shaped by the word. It was shaped by all of these other spiritual realities over here that she was trying to get in touch with, you know, and I think there's an example in, in, in more of a new age setting, which is something that's really infl- infiltrating the church in a lot of ways is a, a separation of, of the, the spirit and the word emphasizing the, the spiritual things and the, the experiences that go along with, with all of that and not letting our definition or idea of the supernatural be shaped by the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. That would be a really, that's preaching, man. I, I mean, yeah, that's a very important point. Earlier in the confession, it says that the inward work of the Holy Spirit bears witness by and with the word in our hearts. It emphasizes the, the Holy Spirit never works contrary to the word. Yeah. And this is where later in the later in this chapter, we're going to get into this. Uh, maybe later, maybe I should leave it alone. But, but I just felt like we're going to say something contradictory later because later it talk about elect infants. Be, being um, regenerated, and so we don't we don't think that happens with the word, though. See what I'm saying? And people who can't understand the word in chapter three. So, in God's providence, sometimes He works in extraordinary ways. Uh, and I think that's just by the spirit apart from the word. So we're not saying God can't do that, but we're just saying ordinarily, this is how he's revealed. He works. The spirit never works contrary to the word. Absolutely. Absolutely. And ordinarily they're, they're, they're always together ordinarily. Yep. Someone counseled me to preach the gospel to your kid. while it's in the womb. Well, the child is in the womb too. So whenever they get ears to hear the, the work and still be working there too. So don't, don't write that off too quick either. Well, yeah, th- no, I think that's good that you read scripture, read stories, whatever to your child in the womb. That's good. Um, but even the confession says by the spirit, right. Uh, elect infants dying in infancy are generated and saved by Christ through the spirit. And I, I think that that that's implying that the, the gospel, you know, without the gospel message, the spirit just does that. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm total agreement. I just wanted to, 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 well, we've, we've kind of skipped ahead to, to, ch- to paragraph three, but let's just, let's just kind of stay there for a minute now that it's on everybody's minds. Uh, because there's a, there's a question here that's kind of, I think going unsaid. And that is just that phrase elect infants dying in infancy, does that mean that there are unelect 
infants? Is that what the confession is trying to, to say? Or what is it? What's the meaning there? And I will say before you answer that Spurgeon's copy of the 1689 did not say elect there. I think that uh, there people disagree on whether infants, when they die, whether they all go to heaven or not. And so the confession allowing for both says elect infants. If you want to say all infants are elect, I think you're in the confession. If you want to say not all infants are elect, you're still within the confession. Good word. I like that. That was well said. And there a good men have been divided on that. Like you say, Spurgeon, John Gill, I think Brodus, um, were all thought all infants were elect infants and saved. That's why Spurgeon left off elect there. Um, so good men. And then you can find good men on the other side as well. So the Bible doesn't address it. And so that's why it doesn't clarify that. And I think that's wise and because the Bible doesn't tell us clearly. I think there are inferences we can make to have a view. Like Jesus said, let the children come to me. The kingdom of heaven is made up of such. I tend to think that there's going to be a lot of babies and infants in, in heaven. So I, I, I favor the view that all infants are elect. But I, I am very... Um, I'm not dogmatic on that, mm-hmm. you right. know, I, I just, <laughs> well, that's my I think, opinion. That's just opinion. And I, and I think that you make a, you make a good point though, that when we were talking earlier about the word and the spirit and how the, the spirit never works contrary to the, to the word. And in cases uh, in paragraph three, those who are incapable of being outwardly called by the ministry of the word, you know, those who are, have a, a mental retardation or, or whatever is, is going on there. We trust that, that God is wise and God is going to do what is right in those situations that, that we can't, we can't understand. I mean, we, we look at the, the astronomical number of abortions that happen and those, we recognize those are human beings. Those are, children and they have a a soul they you know what happens to them when they die i mean we ask that question because we believe that that is that is human life and i think that the only thing that we really can come back to is that god is good god is all wise god knows what he's doing he's gonna do what's right to us (laughs) coming at it from from this perspective I think for, for our, from our perspective, certainly who have a, we have a limited view of, of, of everything, but we would say, well, what is obviously what is good and what is wise is that all of those supported babies are elect, you know, all of those, but like, like you just said, that, that would be, that'd be an opinion. But ultimately, we trust in God's goodness and his wisdom. And Back to, I, I just, I think of a question that, that someone might have about the difference then between maybe a free will theology and what we're saying is we're saying that, that Regeneration, the effectual call, happens before faith, before repentance. It's uh, we believe in monergism, one working, rather than synergism, meaning two working, where semi-Pelagians, Arminians, free willists believe that the human will is the determining factor of salvation, the sovereign determining factor of salvation. So they would believe it's too working. God gives some kind of grace, but the difference is left up to the human will. And so what we're saying is God saves monergistically. He alone saves. But what we're not saying that, that people, there are people running around who are regenerated who aren't, haven't believed yet because everybody who is regenerated believes. We're not saying that, that, 
people don't come to Christ willingly because we're, they absolutely do come willingly. Psalm 110 verse 3 says, in the day of his power, we will come willingly. I'm paraphrasing, but, but so when God works and operates on us, he removes the resistance, the obstinacy uh, is taken away. He gives us a new heart, as the confession says, and Christ becomes the most attractive thing to the soul. And so the, the soul will move willingly, freely, will move towards Christ. What do you yeah. Think of that? yeah, really what we're talking about is in, in the tulip is the, the I, right? The irresistible grace. And I think that that's, that's difficult for some people right there too, just the, the irresistible part. So you're telling me that I can't resist the grace of, of God? I see people resist the grace of God all the time. You know, I mean, that's, that's what, what people say. I've given the illustration of a, a kid walking down the street and, and uh, there's a, a candy store but it's, it's under construction and they, and they put a, a big tarp over it. You can't see it. You know, he walks right, right by. He doesn't know it's there. It's still there. He just doesn't know the, he's blind to it. He can't, he can't see the, the greatness of the, of the candy store, but you know, they, they remove the veil and he sees the, the glass windows and the, and all the candy inside the the neon signs pointing toward, you know, all the, the different things. And, and all the the attractiveness of the candy store, he sees it for what he is, for what it is. Uh, then then he's gonna he's gonna go inside. He's gonna freely choose to to go inside. And I think what we're saying here is in, in that illustration is that it takes God to remove the veil to allow somebody to see the the truth and the the beauty of the gospel. And once they see it. They will freely go inside. In essence, there then the the grace of God is is not something that somebody is going to resist, because once you see the the greatness of the the mercy of of God and and the truth of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, and once that has been made real to a person, because of the supernatural work of God in their heart. Like you said, God gives us a new, a new heart. That person has been taken from death to life. They're going to, they're going to walk in the candy store. They're going to walk into life. So we do freely choose. Yeah. And, and how we're using the word irresistible there, at least how I would use it. Like last night, I was just looking at my wife dealing with my daughter and I, to me, she's just so beautiful, my wife and my daughter, but I'm talking about my wife. And so um, to me, she's irresistible, right? So we're not saying that that he drags you apart from your will to Christ, like you're kicking and screaming the whole way. No, I don't want to be a Christian. He's not He's not doing that. No, he, he makes Christ, like you're saying, so love, the heart is so attracted to Christ when it is made right that it, it will come to Christ. So I feel like we better read paragraph two. <laughs> <clears throat> this effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not from anything at all foreseen in man, nor from any power or agency in the creature being wholly passive therein, being dead in sins and trespasses and tell being quickened and renewed by the Holy spirit is thereby enabled to answer this call and to embrace the grace offered and conveyed in it. And that by no less power than that, which raised up Christ from the dead. So it doesn't name regeneration there either, John, but I don't know if being quickened and renewed be somewhat synonymous. Yeah. He's enabled to be able to answer this call. So let's let's talk a little bit about the the foreseen, not anything at all foreseen in in man. Because some and I think John you pointed this out before we started recording that you know some would look at Romans 8:29 and say, "Well, wait a minute, you know, this what, you know, this this is something that God foresaw in us that we were foreknown." There's a lot of 
a lot of people out there that would say God saves us based on the faith that he foresees in us or the, the merit that he, he sees in some respect. So what, what is this saying here? Well, first of all, if we understand Christianity correctly, we've got to understand the nature of, of a, a man or a woman is totally depraved. It's your, they have a sin nature. So what all God's going to see if he looks into the future and looks at an unbeliever is he's going to see sin. So that, that's all the, that a sinful person is capable of. Um, second of all, that word for no is, doesn't mean God is passively looking into the corridors into the future and trying to find out what someone's going to do as if God doesn't know all things. There's all kinds of problems with that view of foreknowledge. First of all, it's just, it, it makes God into somebody who looks and learns, which that means God doesn't know all things, but that's a problem. So if we're someone who did, has, has decided rightly that God knows everything all the time, he never learns anything, then it isn't him looking into the future and, and then learning something. And then if we trace that word back into the beginning of our Bibles, we're going to see that Adam knew Eve. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to see this, this word know in the Bible is an intimate word for relate. It's a relationship word. And so without going into the uh, full uh, study of the word, I believe it comes down to God choosing beforehand to have a love relationship with people. And it only makes sense in first Peter one twenty. Christ was foreknown. Okay. So that, that, that makes no sense. He foresaw looked into the future and foresaw Christ. That, that doesn't make any sense at all. So we're saying that God's foreknowledge is active, not passive. So we don't think there's any biblical basis to say that he chose us or called us on the basis of anything he foresaw in us. But it was God's free and special grace alone. How does grace, how does grace get defined then? A lot of, a lot of people would say we're saved by God's grace, but they would also believe that, I mean, growing up, my, my mom taught me all the time, you know, we are, we are saved by God's grace. It's not from what you do, but she also said, God looks down the tables of time and see who's going to respond to him. And that's how he knows. That's how he chooses. You know, so she was saying both things since then she's come around just in case she listens. <laughs> <laughs> Receiving unmerited favor, something you don't earn. So there's a contradiction there. If, if you do something to get it, then it's not grace. And it's grace alone, not grace plus something else. Yeah, I think that I think the concept of grace is so hard to understand that we have a proclivity to automatically add things to it and not even know we're doing that. For instance, my mom, my uh, Pastors that I had grown up, they would have defined grace as unmerited favor. I mean, I knew that definition growing up, but then ultimately you're always, <laughs> it seems like they're always adding things to it. If you want to be a Christian, then you do this. It, it gets confusing. You know, God looks down the tables of time, sees who will respond. Well, so it's based on what you do or it's based on God, you know, it, so I think when you really start looking at, at grace and, and what it is, that it is unmerited favor of God alone, not based on anything that we are doing or will do or have done, then we continue to start seeing areas in which we add things to it. I think when you understand the doctrines of grace, effectual calling, total depravity, unconditional election, these doctrines that a couple of them we, we mentioned already today, we we're talking about effectual call today, but once you understand these things, I think then you really get, you get you're able to grasp the biblical idea of grace. If you continue to hold on to something 
that you've done that separates you from the next guy, why you're going to be in heaven and he's going to be in hell because of something you've done. I don't think you're ever really going to understand God's grace. And that's what it usually comes down to. You know, why, why, why you? Well, I, you know, I was, I guess I was, I guess smart enough to realize, well, okay. So you're smarter. Okay. Or a little wiser or had the right experiences. No, it's just grace. God's grace. Yeah. I like the the end of that paragraph too. He is thereby enabled to answer this call and to embrace the, the grace offered and conveyed in it. And that is by no less power than that which raised up Christ from the dead. You know, that, that power that enables us to, to respond is, is the same power that, that raised Jesus from the dead. And that's, that's something. Can't do it on our own. Supernatural. Okay, for the sake of time, paragraph four. Others, not elected, although they may be called by the ministry of the word and may have some common operations of the spirit, yet not being effectually drawn by the Father, they neither will nor can truly come to Christ and therefore cannot be saved. Much less can men that do not receive the Christian religion be saved, be they never so diligent to frame their lives according to the light of nature and the law of that religion they do profess. So this is saying that uh, that word and spirit operate on the unbeliever because they always go together, right? Word and spirit go together, but not savingly. the The gospel comes, and it's a it's a true gospel offer, a true offer from God that He will forgive their sins upon their repentance and faith. It's a true offer. And they stand condemned if they deny, if they reject it, they're, they're more, they're more guilty for, for having that message and then rejecting it. They're, they're responsible to respond. But, um, but the, but the non-elect person, they will not get the effectual call. So when the gospel message comes to them at the Billy Graham crusade, the spirit surely is at work, but, but, and they may feel bad. They may even have a, a sort of joy over the thought of forgiveness of sins. The natural man can have these sort of responses and yet not be totally saved. We think of the parable of the sower, the, the one, the one responded with joy. So, so there can be a natural working of the spirit on the, on the person. And yet they could fall short of the effectual call of being regenerated, being born again. That's one of the things that, that I think with those evangelism, uh, often with evangelism crusades, is, is it's a formula. You know, we preach the gospel. You have people come down or raise their hand. They say this prayer. You t- give them this little tract that says you're now a Christian. Now go and live the abundant life, whatever. God has a wonderful plan for your life, whatever. But what saves is faith. Repentance and faith. You can do that in your chair, folks. You know, and if, and if God so takes this message and, and saves you by it, you're going to be saved as you hear it. You're going to read, you're going to believe the message. And when you believe the message, you're going to be saved. And so, uh, boy, that, that, that's getting me off on a rabbit trail. I to apologize, but yes, but we're not saying that, that whoever hears the gospel and if they want to come to Christ or if they want to believe, they can't because they're not elect. There's just there's not these people running around the world who want to be a Christian who aren't elect. That isn't a category of people. If you really want to be a Christian, you're elect. If you really want the Lord Jesus Christ, that is elect. If you really believe in Christ, you're elect. That's that's the point. Ephesians two eight. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it, faith, is the gift of God. Salvation is completely, totally by grace, the work that God does. Philippians 129, it has been granted to you not over to suffer for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for Christ's sake. And that's, and that's our only hope. You know, if, if somebody says, 
you know, well, this isn't, this isn't fair. This doesn't sound right. You know, that we have nothing to do with this, that we are, you know, passive in the the process, like the confession says in in paragraph two there, you got to ask what, what other hope do we have? You know, if the, if the Bible is writing, explaining the, the effect of, of sin, the, the state of sin and the, the consequences of that, I mean, our, our only hope is that Jesus Christ in his, in his grace rescues us, that, that there's, that there's mercy there that's apart from anything that we can do because anything that we would do would only taint that and further condemn us. And like we're talking about here, the, the guy that goes to the crusade and wants to believe, wants to turn his life around. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, I knew a, a guy that came to church and I mean, he got baptized and said all the, the right things and, uh, came out later because he was wanted to impress a girl. And when the girl dumped him, he was out of there. You, know, you would have never known that at the time. You know, you would have, you would have never guessed. You would have thought that he was completely genuine in, in all of that. You know, he grew up in church, so he, he knew the lingo, but wasn't worth it. If he wasn't going to get the girl, you know, for a time it was, it was worth it. Yeah. And I, 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 I think also just a clarification, some, some, we, uh, God doesn't believe for us. We, we must do that. That's something we do. We believe, but God enables us to believe. He gives us the faith. It's a supernatural thing. And so it's something we exercise, but because God has acted upon us. So in a sense, we, you know, we, we like the Arminian will say, yeah, you, you do have to, you do have to come to Christ. You do have to choose Christ. You do have to, to willingly turn from your sins and embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have to willingly do that. It's something you must do. But what we're saying is, is now, uh, what we're saying is, is yes, but why? Why this guy and not that guy? Why you and, and not him? We're saying because of God's grace, God has chosen some. And he would be just to send us all to hell. If you would like to learn more about the Renewal Podcast or find past episodes, uh, check us out on the web at RenewalCast.com or visit us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash RenewalCast. If you would like to learn more about Bethel Church, find other resources there, please visit the church website at BethelMBChurch.org or connect with us there on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Bethel MB Church. Now Bethel Church exists to bring glory to God by promoting the, the joyful worship of Jesus Christ both in, in our context and to the ends of the earth.